Well, it's a a joy to be with you this morning. Uh, We're going to be in Ephesians 6. So you can uh, turn your Bibles to Ephesians 6. In SMED this weekend is uh, actually at the Expositor Seminary graduation in Florida. So as you know, he is a faculty faculty member of the seminary, uh, and he gets to go to the the graduation. So we'll be taking a break from Revelation this week. He'll be back, uh, plan is to be back next week in Revelation, our verse-by-verse exposition. But we are going to be uh, this morning in Ephesians 6, looking at the, the armor of God, a familiar passage to us. So I'm going to be working through verses 14 through 17, but, but let's start in verse 10. Ephesians 6, we'll be reading verse 10 through verse 17. God says, through the Apostle Paul, Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the full armor of God so that you will be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the full armor of God so that you will be able to resist in the evil day. And having done everything to stand, for, stand firm, Stand firm, therefore, having girded your loins with truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace, in addition to all, taking up the shield of faith, with which you will be able to extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God." At the start of this year, I had the opportunity to go on a trip, a seminary trip to Israel, and it was a study trip. We visited a lot of sites, a lot of locations, uh, heard a lot of stories, saw a lot of archaeology, but I think the most memorable part of that trip was not a a site that we visited, but it was actually a bus ride. As we took a bus ride in the northern part of Israel, the tour guide, who was an Israeli national, uh, he was a, a veteran of the Israeli army, he told the story of war. And he told us the, the story of a specific war, the Yom Kippur War. And it wasn't just a story about the war, it was actually his experience of the war. He told us what it was like to be a, a six-year-old boy during this battle. You see, the, the nation of Israel got its independence in 1948. And in the 1960s, they actually expanded their territory. There was some significant victories. And then in 1973, the Yom Kippur War, this war that he talked about. And it's called the Yom Kippur War because it was uh, on the day of Yom Kippur. This is the Day of Atonement, the most special Sabbath day of the year for the Jewish people. And this man told the story of being a six-year-old boy playing at the park with his sister. And then the, the missiles came. It was a surprise attack, bombings. He talked about the devastation of war, the chaos. He talked about his father being sent out to battle not knowing if he'd return home. And as he described this war, he says that the Jews had become complacent. They, they had had some victories. There was some pride and arrogance that were, were unconquerable. They had become complacent, overconfident, unprepared, and the enemy attacked when they least expected it. And a Sabbath day in Israel is not like a, a holiday here. And especially the, the most prominent Sabbath day, Yom Kippur, the, the whole world shuts down. They don't drive, they don't, they don't cook food, they don't work. And they were not prepared for this battle. And he went on to tell us that now, 50 years later, the, the military still sees this battle, uh, uh, this unprepared battle, this onslaught from the enemy. They said, this will never happen again, he said. We will never be unprepared. And if you know now, the Israeli Defense Force is one of the, the most advanced, technologically advanced armies in the world. They were the first army to have a missile defense system, an air missile defense system. Uh, a country that's surrounded by enemies on each side. And he said, now we are prepared. We will never let this happen again. And as I read this passage, I think about that story. Think about this, this passage that, that hopefully shakes us awake that tells us that we are actually in the midst of a war, in the midst of a battle. And you might be sitting here like the six-year-old boy playing at the park on, on holiday, 
thinking that everything is fine, just enjoying life. And this passage says, no, there is a spiritual war going on. You are in the midst of it. If you are in Christ, then you are in this battle. And you must be prepared. You must be prepared not to, to take the easy path, not to just coast, but to stand, to stand for the sake of Christ. I was uh, at a coffee shop this week reading this passage, and I saw a t-shirt brand. I've seen it a couple times now, but the brand says, Lions, Not Sheep. Lions, Not Sheep. And it struck me as I was reading this, and I think what the brand means is don't, don't be just uh, go, on, go on with the flow, you know, be your own man. Uh, don't be led by the masses, kind of this idea. But what's really interesting is that Jesus actually says the opposite about his people. Uh, in Matthew 10, when Jesus commissions his disciples to go out and preach, he says, I send you out, not as lions, I send you out as lambs, as sheep in the midst of wolves. And we think about this battle, a hostile world, an enemy, and Jesus sends us out as lambs, as helpless creatures, a little ball of fur with no defense system. And then we read this passage, we find out we are not helpless. We have a supply of strength. We have strength from the Lord himself. We have resources from the king of heaven. And we're going to look at these spiritual resources, this, this armor that we must put on. But before we do that, we have to look at the nature of the battle. Verses 11 through 13, they tell us what the, the nature of, his, of this battle is, what kind of armor we need, who the enemy is. How, how do we fight this battle? Look at verse 11. It says we must put on this armor, God's armor, so that we will be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. We find out that the enemy here is the devil, Satan himself. In verse 16, he's called the evil one. In Ephesians 2.2, 2, he's called the prince of the power of the air the one who is ruling over this world system. And he has deceitful schemes, it says. And these schemes, this is not like a, a toddler that's scheming, how do I get the candy in the pantry? These are deceitful schemes. These are diabolical schemes. Plans bent on destruction and death. And Satan is called the father of lies. He first shows up in Genesis 3, and you remember his first words in Genesis 3. Did God really say... He starts on the first pages of the Bible, undermining God's word, undermining his authority. Did he really say, does he really care? Why would he withhold that good tree from you, Adam and Eve? Why would he not give you that fruit that looks so good to eat? He, he sows seeds of doubt against God's character. He is scheming, lying, deceiving. So we find out here what this battle is about. If Satan is lying to you, if he's trying to, to deceive you, if he's trying to get you to believe falsehood, th then this is not a, a physical battle. This is a battle in the mind. This is a battle for truth. This is a battle of what you will believe. Will you believe truth about God and his character and his word? This is a battle over thoughts and ideas. In verse 12, he says it's not against flesh and blood, it's not a physical battle not something we can see with our eyes or touch with our hands. And every time we open our Bible, we're reminded of this truth. We're reminded that this world is not all there is. What you can accumulate for yourself in this world, there is more to life than that. There is more to life than what stimulates your senses, than what you can see. There are spiritual realities. There are eternal realities. There is a heaven. There is a hell. There is judgment. There are consequences for actions. And we find out here there are evil forces, Satan and demons, that are opposing God and opposing his people. Satan here in verse 11 is scheming, and we find out in verse 12 that he has a whole army. There is a whole army at odds with God, at odds with his people. He has troops. He has commanders and generals. Look what it says in verse 12. There are rulers. There are powers. There are world forces, these rulers and powers, there's a hierarchy here. There's rank and file. There's organization to this army. And when he says forces, that is to say there is a, a multitude of troops. You remember in, in Mark chapter 5 when Jesus cast out the demon from the garrison, the one who lived in the tombs, and he cast him into the pigs. And what did the demon say his name was? 
He said, I am legion, for there are many of us. A legion in the Roman army was 6,000 troops, all in one man. There are legions and legions of demons, forces of evil. And it says in verse 12, they are fighting on the side of darkness and wickedness. Imagery of darkness is used throughout the Bible. Uh, Darkness, the idea of spiritual blindness, a mindset that is opposed to God, opposed to his truth. 2 Corinthians 4.4 says that Satan has blinded the minds of unbelievers lest they would see the light of the glory of the gospel, lest they would be saved. They're, They're blinded. And in Christ, we have freedom from spiritual blindness. We have eyes to see. And once we are in Christ, now we can see that there is indeed a battle. And this battle is culminating. Verse 13, he says, Therefore, take up the full armor, so that you will be able to resist in the evil day. And this evil day is, is not a future eschatological event. You know, the book of Revelation, there will be an evil day when Satan has his Antichrist lead the the nations of the world. But here I think this is a personal day. You, believer, there will be an evil day. There will be onslaughts. There will be battles. There will be specific days and seasons of temptation. Prepare yourself for that day, a coming day. This will happen. (laughs) And as you live out your Christian life and you become a light in a dark place, the forces of darkness will notice. If you live a pure life, if you speak the truth at the workplace, if if you live a life that's transformed by the gospel, you will draw attention to yourself. The battle will intensify. And here he says, do not be unprepared. The evil day will come and you must be ready to stand. This war, the Yom Kippur war, is coming when you least expect it. So hopefully now you're, you're convinced that you need armor, you need protection, you need strength from the Lord for this battle. So let's dive into the verses 14 through 17. They're going to tell us what the, the fortification is. What is this armor that we need? And Paul writes this letter from prison. So he is surrounded by Roman troops, being guarded by Roman soldiers. Every day he's watching. He sees their armor. He sees what they're wearing. So he uses this as a picture for us. These six items we're going to see. Uh, a belt, a breastplate, shoes, a shield, a helmet, and a sword. Uses uh, physical realities to tell us about spiritual truth. These, this is how you must be equipped. And it was a high honor to be a Roman soldier. You're fighting in the, the greatest army in the world. Well, here for the Christian, if you are in Christ, you are part of the Lord's army. And you know this, if you are in Christ, you know the hostility. You know the battle in your own mind, the battle against temptation, the battle against your own flesh, the the battle to believe what God says and to obey it. And we're going to see spiritual resources, armor here. We could spend six weeks on this. We could work through each of these. We have have just this time, we're going to work through just all six of them this morning. So we'll go quickly through each. So we're going to see six fortifications for a courageous soldier in the Lord's army. These are fortifications for a soldier in the Lord's army, one who would be courageous. A few years ago, we went to the World War II Museum in New Orleans. And in this museum, they have a a D-Day exhibit. And it's pretty fascinating. They document just all of the the happenings of D-Day, this monumental battle, really a climactic battle that that changed the war. And D-Day, as you know, is one of the greatest battles in modern history uh, in this exhibit, they say that it probably the most boats ever assembled in one place at the same time. And in this exhibit, there is a plaque. And I just thought it captures this idea so well. It captures the idea of being a, a courageous soldier in an army. And it's a dedication to the infantry, the ones who storm the beaches. And this is what the, the quote on the plaque says. It says, When you talk about combat leadership under fire on the beach at Normandy, I don't see how the credit can go to anyone other than the company-grade officers and senior NCOs who led the way. It is good to be reminded that there are such men, that there have always been and always will be. We sometimes forget, I think, that you can manufacture weapons, you can purchase ammunition, but you can't buy valor, and you can't pull heroes off an assembly line. I love that last line, you can't pull heroes off an assembly line. 
So we're gonna, we're gonna see this morning, I'm sure we all wanna be men and women of valor, of courage. We wanna stand firm. We're gonna see that there is a path to get there. This is what the Lord has for us so we can be men and women of valor, of courage. No, number one, the courageous soldier is prepared by truth. Prepared by truth. Paul starts in verse 14 with the command to stand. Stand therefore. And, and this is how you must stand. By first, taking up the belt of truth or the girdle of truth, your translation might say. Girding your loins with truth. In the ancient world, men wore wrong, long robes. So a belt or, or a girdle was not worn as a, a decoration, you know, not so you could show off your American flag, but it was actually worn to tuck up the robe so you wouldn't trip, so that you could actually move freely in battle. If the enemy came upon you and you didn't have your, ro your robe cinched up, you weren't going to be prepared. You were going to trip. You were going to fall. And the girdle was off or the belt was off. You were in a relaxed position while you're eating, while you're reclining. So this is the first step. So you can't do anything else unless you start here. Be prepared by truth. Suit up, he's saying. Get in the defensive posture. Be prepared for battle. And this is how we prepare with truth. The first fortification, God's truth. Uh, truth here as the, the body of doctrine. What the New Testament teaches, what the Bible teaches. Comprehensively, Jude 3 similar, similarly says, to contend earnestly for the faith once for all handed down to the saints. You know, this idea of a body of truth, collective body of doctrine. And this doctrine makes up the Christian faith. This is what we believe. Obviously the Bible in view, but comprehensively. He's saying be grounded in the word of God. Be, be grounded in the doctrines of scripture. Know what the scripture teaches. Because the devil will bring assaults on that truth. He will bring false teaching into the church. If we think about heresy that comes in, heretical doctrines, heresy, to, to define it for you, would be the doctrines that if you believe these doctrines, they are damnable. Damnable doctrines. To deny the deity of Christ, that is a damnable doctrine. You can't have a savior who is not God. You need a righteousness that you don't have. You need God's own righteousness. To deny the Trinity, that is heresy. To deny substitutionary atonement. So if you are able to stand, you have to know sound doctrine. You have to know the truth. You have to be grounded in the scripture. You have to know truth about salvation, about God, about his sovereignty, about sin. You have to know about sanctification, about the church. And you have to bring that truth to bear in your heart, in your mind. And just consider all the assaults of the devil against truth. The assaults against the inerrancy of Scripture. That it, it's, not, it's not totally accurate. There are errors in that book. There are inconsistencies. There's assaults against its authority. It's just a man-made book. It's just a tra tradition passed down by men. There are assaults against its sufficiency. You know, there's some good things in there, but it, it can't help with life's real problems. But, but no, this book is truth. Every word of it is truth. It is absolutely authoritative. It is without rival. It's not wishy-washy. They're not gray areas. It is objectively true. It is what God says. In this battle, there's going to be false teachers, false doctrines, false ideologies, false worldviews. There's going to be lies and deception that come at you. And you have to be grounded in the truth. Before you step out of the house in the culture we're in, you have to know the truth. I just want to commend to you, if you haven't listened to it yet, Smed did it in an equipping hour a couple weeks ago. It's titled, How Did We Get Here? If you look online, May 7th, equipping hour, how did we get here? Smed just talked about the, the worldviews, the ideologies that our culture has bought into. This led to all the confusion about gender and sexuality. And he just makes the point there that this is a, a worldview issue. A spiraling worldview. People that don't have a biblical framework. They have bought into a, a lie that says that I get to define my own truth. That my identity is determined by how I feel. And you have in that uh, the lie of humanism. that says that this physical world is all there is. It says there are no consequences for your actions. There's no accountability. 
So you can think about yourself apart from God. There is no such thing as, as righteousness and as sin. And now our culture is in a place that would say that perverse actions are actually rooted in your identity. Worse than the lie of no accountability for your actions, they're actually saying that, that your actions should be celebrated. These things should be, other people should embrace them. Do so you see, this is a battle of worldviews. Both things cannot be true at the same time. Either Christ is king on his throne. He is the one ordering the universe. We are accountable to him. And he gets to define personhood, gender, sexuality, or, or the king is self. In the self, I get to define my own truth. Both of those cannot be true at the same time. We are in a battle. You must fight this battle. You must know truth. I think about just the moms, the moms here with the little ones. As you have a three-year-old running around the house, you get to fight this battle as you instruct your kids in a biblical worldview. You get to teach them that there is a God. You get to teach them that we live under his authority. You teach them that there are consequences for our actions. That you can't just do whatever you want. That God actually will hold you accountable. You teach them about authority structures. You teach them that God made two genders. You teach them that you don't get to be whatever you want to be. You get to embrace what God has made you to be. And you teach them that this book is authoritative. And we fight this battle in our homes with little ones. We're, we are building a framework for biblical truth to protect them. And this is why being in a, a solid church, I don't have to convince you, you're all here, but just to sit under God's word being preached week by week, being opened, hearing this is what God says, building a, a doctrinal framework from passages of the Bible. And this is a call for each of us, each individual believer, be a student of the Bible. Learn the doctrines of Scripture. Be equipped so that you can stand firm. So this is where the, the battleground starts. And it starts in your, own, in your own heart, what you believe. And we're going to see next is, what do you do with that truth? Do you, do you live that truth out? 1 Timothy 3.15 says that the church is the pillar and support of truth. You think about a Roman pillar in a, in a Roman building. The pillar uh, held up the building, but also was decorative. It's artwork. Well, in the same way, the church, we hold up the truth and we adorn it. We display the truth by how we live. And that's going to bring us to the second point, this breastplate of righteousness. Number two, we are protected. The fortified soldier in God's army is protected by righteous living. Protected by righteous living. This is living out the truth. So you know the truth and now you live it out. And the breastplate, this is a, a piece of armor, a strap that goes on your front and back, protecting your vital organs. It protects you in, in long-range combat and in close-range combat. And this protection here comes from a, a righteous life, the breastplate of righteousness. And there are a couple options here. As you hear this word righteousness, you could think about uh, imputed righteousness, you know, God at salvation, God imputes righteousness to us, credits us with righteousness that we don't deserve, we didn't earn. Jesus' own righteousness imputed to us. Our sin on him on the cross, and we get his righteousness. That is declared righteousness. God in heaven says that the sinner is now righteous because of Christ. But, but here it's talking about practical righteousness, living a righteous life. We live in a way that reflects what heaven has declared to be true. We live a life of integrity. This is a blameless life. Not, not a perfect life, but a life that keeps short accounts with sin, that confesses and forsakes sin. A life above reproach, that no accusation would stick on you. And that blameless life becomes a protection for this battle. The devil, who is called the accuser of God's people, he, he wants to bring reproach on the name of Christ. And our righteous life protects us. This is a weighty reality to think that, that we are ambassadors for Christ. We represent Jesus in this world and to this world. We adorn the gospel by how we live. We say this, this truth is, is real. Look at my life to prove it. Look at the testimony of my life. And just consider the damage you can do with immoral living. The, the accusations that can be made about you that would stick. 
the inability to stand tall with assurance, with confidence, the lack of a, a clean conscience. A few years ago, I received a, an email, and the, the subject line of the email was my email password. So it's like, you know, there's, there's scams, but that's a pretty effective scam. It's like, oh, you obviously, you have my email password. And in the, in the body of the email, it's, you know, some kind of extortion, send money to this account, or we'll expose all these things. You know, in a moment, it's like, oh, man, this is terrible. And then a minute later, wait, I, those things aren't true. I don't, I don't have anything to be exposed. You know, it's like all of a sudden, I just remember in that moment thinking, oh, man, praise the Lord for the protection that comes from a clean conscience. Not having things to hide. Not having something that you're worried about. Oh, what if that comes to light? There's a protection by, by living righteously. You, you can't battle against falsehood, against these deceitful schemes if you are regularly embracing falsehood in your own life, in your own heart. You won't be ready to take on attacks if you are slumped over in shame, if you are giving in to temptation. But live a life of integrity. You can stand tall. Uh, one pastor has defined integrity as the consistent harmony of convictions and conduct. Integrity is the, the harmony between your convictions and your conduct. What you say you believe and what you actually do. So first you have to know the truth, you be convinced of it, and then and now you live the truth. And number three, the courageous soldier is steadied by the gospel. Steadied by the gospel. Verse 15 says, having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Saying put the right shoes on so you can be prepared for battle. You have the soldier dressing himself. He puts on his belt he puts on his breastplate, and now his shoes, and a special kind of shoe. The, the Romans invented a thick boot for war. It was an open-toed boot. But at the bottom of this boot was a thick layer of leather. And in this leather, there was, there was actually studs. This was a cleat, a cleat intended for war, for hand-to-hand -hand combat. They had everyday sandals for just, just everyday living, and then they had a, a wartime boot, the cleat. So the image here is of being on guard, of standing firm, of being prepared. And you, you read this phrase, fitted with the gospel of peace, your shoes fitted. And you might think about Romans 10. Romans 10 that says, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach good news. And Romans 10 exalts the messenger who, whose feet are beautiful because they run with the gospel. They run to new places to preach but here the idea isn't running with the gospel. It's a steadying that comes from the gospel. Just look at the, the command in verse 14. It starts with stand firm. 14, 15, 16. These are all modifiers of how do you stand firm? Well, you have to have the, the belt. You have to have the breastplate. And to stand firm, you have to have the right shoes. So he's telling us this is how you stand firm. This is how you are steadied. You are steadied by the gospel. As you know, the, the Super Bowl was hosted in Phoenix this year. And there was a, a storyline after the Super Bowl of a lot of players were slipping on the grass. And they had, they had built this grass, they had grown this grass specifically for this one game. It was a special blend of grass. They spent months preparing. And they get to the Super Bowl and everyone's slipping on it. Either it's too thick, too wet, didn't have the right shoes. And, and in a football game, you, you slip, that's a big deal. You might give up a touchdown. But think about in battle. You slip in hand-to-hand -hand combat, and the stakes are deadly. So he's saying, don't slip. Have the right shoes so that you can stand firm. And what gives you this sure footing is the gospel of peace. The, the gospel, this message from heaven, a proclamation from God of good news, a proclamation of salvation. If you've ever asked someone, just uh, someone on the street, maybe a friend, how does someone get into heaven? How do you know if you're going to heaven? Have you ever asked someone that? 90% of the time, the answer that you're going to get is, you know, I, I do enough good things. I do more good things than bad things. I just be better than everybody else. I don't, I don't kill or, or, or steal, and then I should be good. And if you are here and you think that's what will get you to heaven, I just have to do enough good things. Well, that is not good news. That is actually terrible news because the Bible says that even our good things are as filthy rags to God because they, they come from a polluted heart. 
So what we need is, is God to rescue us. That is the, the message of the gospel. That God saves sinners, that Jesus died in the place of sinners. That those who believe in Jesus, those who see their sin rightly, that cry out for a savior, that they will be rescued. So the ones that believe that message, that look to Jesus for rescue, they have peace with God, objective peace. Peace in the midst of battle, in the midst of the war here. You see what Paul is driving at. You have the battle on all sides, and he says, and you have gospel peace. While the, the battle rages, the enemy swarms, peace. In Ephesians 2, a couple chapters earlier, Paul says that you who were formerly far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. Verse 14, he says, for he himself is our peace. The, the war is raging and you have peace because you have Christ. Because you are part of his family, because he has rescued you. So we must cling to these gospel realities if we're going to stand firm. We must remember who we were apart from Christ. We must remember what Christ did for us on the cross. We must remember his kindness to us. We must remember that we were hopeless. We were helpless. We were on a path toward destruction. But God, but God was kind. He rescued us. And these aren't just, just truisms that we throw out. You have to cultivate this thankfulness in your heart. And just consider the, the thankfulness, the gratefulness that is produced by the gospel. To understand that God rescued us from judgment through the death of his own son. But you neglect these truths. You take them for granted. You stop rejoicing in them. You, you will not have sure footing to stand on. We are so vulnerable when we are thankless. If you're dominated by, by fear, by anxiety, by your circumstances, that, that will rob you of peace. If what is most pressing on you is your situation, and you think, in order for me to have peace right now, I need, I need something to change in my life. That is the only way I can have peace. If this situation changes, you are vulnerable in that moment. You are vulnerable because you have objective peace with Christ, regardless of circumstance. And also consider just the, the humbling effect of the gospel. The gospel, it smashes pride, destroys human boasting. You were saved not because of you, but because of God's kindness. Despite you, you are the problem. And if you are regularly reminding your heart these truths, that fights against entitlement. If we forget to do this, we'll become entitled, self-sufficient, self-reliant. We start to think that we're, we're a gift to the Lord. He needs me. He needs my abilities. And discontentment creeps in. Lack of love for others creeps in. And you are vulnerable. So you must be steadied. Steadied for this battle. Made ready for this battle by the gospel. Peace that you have with the living God. And for the one who is standing tall, the one who is living righteously, the one who is fortified in truth, who is soaking in these realities, now the, the onslaught comes. We see in verse 16 that, that flaming arrows come. The, the evil one, the devil, now is targeting this one. And you cling to the shield of faith. Number four, the courageous soldier is shielded by faith. Shielded by faith. This shield here that protects from these flaming arrows and not just arrows, these are flaming arrows launched by the evil one uh, to pierce you and then to, to set on fire. Immediate impact and long-term damage. The devil here is looking to get a foothold, a weakness to get in and to spread like fire, to destroy. And the shield is the barrier, a large piece of wood covered in animal skin, something you could hide behind. And it's a little bit uh, antithetical here. When you think about a shield of faith, hold on to this thing, hide behind this thing, and you think about what faith is. Faith is confidence in what you can't see. Trust in, in, in who God is despite what you see. So grasp at the thing that you can't see on, on the God who promises, who is faithful. He starts verse 16 by saying, in addition to all. That is to say, in all these things, or throughout this whole battle, 
You can't do any of these things apart from faith. All of this must be done in faith. You have to look away from yourself. You have to look at the, the character and the strength of God. And faith is not some kind of warm feeling. This is all going to work out. No, no, faith is in a person. Faith is in, in God and who he is and what he does. We talk about faith in God's word. We are saying, I, I trust that what God says is true because I trust that God is true. I trust that, that he will do what he says because he has the power. Because he is the ultimate truth teller. So it is confidence in God's character. So this shield, this shield of faith is, is faith in the character of God. Psalm 3.3, 3, the psalmist says, you are a shield about me. This is confidence in the person of God. So this is the, the battle, and you know this, the battle for belief. Battle in the heart. Will I trust God? Will I trust what he says? Through these uh, onslaughts, you know, we talked about false worldviews, ideologies, false teachers, false doctrine, but also temptations, pressures, the lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, the boastful pride of life, all the things that come at us, the temptations towards sin. And through all of it, we cling to faith. We cling to God. We cling to what he says. When temptation is raging in our heart, when we don't feel like it, especially when we don't feel like it, when our flesh screams against it, we have faith. We are shielded by faith in a good God. So you stand firm, he says, girded with truth, protected by a righteous life, steadied in the gospel, shielded by humble faith. And now verse 17, actually a different command in verse 17. Now take up. Now that you are ready, he says, take up these last two things. It gives us a, a sense of the nearness of the battle. The battle is coming. You are about to be attacked head on. The hand-to-hand -hand combat, combat is at your doorstep. Now take up your helmet and your sword. So fifthly, a courageous soldier is preserved by promises. Preserved by promises. This helmet of salvation, a future hope, coming salvation, deliverance, an inheritance, a trust that God's promises will not fail. And a helmet here because an imminent blow is coming. The enemy's weapon is about to smash your head. It's coming for you. So he's saying cling with a white knuckle grip to God's salvation, regardless of what happens, regardless of what circumstance you find yourself in. Regardless of what trial, what discouragement, what conflict, what diagnosis you receive, regardless of any of those things, you have hope, a sure hope in heaven. Satan cannot snatch that away from you. The devil can't take you with him. If you are in Christ, Satan wants to make you miserable. He wants to, the gospel to look weak. He wants to rob God of glory, but he can't take you with him. You are protected in Christ. We have an inheritance, 1 Peter 1, 4. We have an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, kept in heaven. The devil can't take that from you. He can't deal you a fatal blow. Your head is protected. Your salvation is secure. So here he's saying, don't forget the hope that you have in Christ. Hope is, is confidence in the future. You could define hope as confidence that God's plan will unfold the way that he has promised it will. And we need this hope as we live in a hostile world. And we will face hostility. The thing about Jesus' promise, he says, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. There's a, a guarantee of hostility. The gates of hell, the very armies of hell are against the church. They are against what we do here. Satan hates the church. He hates that we sing praise together about God's goodness and his grace. He hates that we have transformed lives. He hates that we love one another selflessly. He hates that you would instruct your kids with truth. And he hates that you would sit here and listen to God's word. He hates all of it. In the gates of hell, all of its armies are against what we do here. They are against what you do in your homes. They are against the ministries of this church, against the fellowship that we have. And in this battle, in this hatred, with all of these enemies, us being lambs in the midst of wolves, 
Jesus does not leave us without a weapon. Verse 17, the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. We have a weapon for this battle. If you were going to go out to battle and you, you only had time to grab one thing, think of this list here, the shoes, the breastplate, the helmet. But if the enemy was at your doorstep, if they were already there, if you were exposed, you had no time to repair, you would grab the sword. When your faith is weak, when your hope is waning, when you feel shaken, you have to grab hold of that which never changes, that which stands fixed forever in the heavens, the word of God. This is a defensive and offensive weapon. It protects, and it's the only, only weapon, the only tool here that does damage to the enemy. In the Roman army, they had two different kinds of swords. They had a, a large sword, maybe on horseback, that you could, you could ride and you could smash enemies. But it was not good for hand-to-hand -hand combat. It was too heavy. So they also had a, a smaller sword. That's the sword pictured here. A dagger, just a couple feet long, for, for close range. Hand-to-hand -hand combat, when the enemy is at your doorstep. The same word for sword here in Hebrews 4. The word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword. So God gives us this weapon. He, he gives us his word. He left us a book. His word that's breathed out for us, without error, flawless. It stands fixed forever in the heavens. Every word proves itself to be true in this book. It enlightens the eyes, brings understanding to the simple. It equips, trains us in righteousness. As Peter says, it gives us everything we need for life and godliness. So this dagger, it has precision. It is a quick weapon. It thwarts the enemy's attacks. There's a call here for us to know specific passages of Scripture, to not just know truisms, to not just say, yeah, I know, I know the Bible says don't be anxious. Somewhere it says that, but actually no passages. I've worked through Matthew 6. I've preached to myself Jesus' sermon where he says not to be anxious, where he talks about his care for his people, to, to know passages of the Bible, to work through those things, to have traveled in those truths, you're faced with lust, and you know Proverbs 7. I've worked through. I've worked through Proverbs 7. I know the, the nature of the attack that's coming. I've talked to, to younger people about this. As they're struggling with something, just, just start with one verse. Start with one truth. Tomorrow, get up. Meditate on one truth, one verse from Scripture. Arm yourself with that truth for today. You're struggling with anger. Start to meditate on verses about anger. When you wake up in the morning, meditate on those truths. Preach sermons to your own heart. And we have this one weapon. And this weapon has power. This word, this is the very power that brought you from death to life. You were in spiritual darkness. Ephesians 2 says that you were dead. You were enslaved to sin and you were actually in lockstep with Satan. You were marching with Satan's army. That's who all of us were before Christ. And this word, God's word came to us. It impacted our hearts. It gave us, he gave us eyes to see. And God's word has power because it comes from the mouth of God himself. It is the means that the spirit uses to unleash his power in this world. I've heard one, uh, one author say that the spirit rides best in his own chariot. This is the, the spirit's word. And we only have one weapon against the, the forces, against the rulers, against the false systems, and it is the most powerful weapon. We don't have some kind of ingenuity, formula, strategy, but we have God's timeless, unchanging word. I mentioned uh, Omri and the team going to New Orleans earlier. Think about that team going into a hostile place, into a place full of immorality, full of lies and deception, and they don't go there with some kind of innovative program. They don't go there with some unique method of discipleship. No, they go there armed with the very word of God, with power from God. And they'll unleash that word. They'll, they'll proclaim it with their mouths. They're, they'll testify to it with their lives. That's what makes the church unique. That's what makes this church unique. Not programs, not methods. That we have God's word. We teach it. We speak it to one another. We study it. The ministries in this church center around the word of God. This is our weapon. And we unleash this word in enemy territory. 
And as we unleash God's word, as we stand tall with a boldness that comes from a righteous life, with a humility that comes from a preparation of the gospel, with confidence rooted in the very character of God, and with a a certain hope, a hope of salvation, we proclaim this truth. And some of you might read a passage like this, you might hear a sermon like this, and you might be struggling. You might feel like you're losing this battle. Maybe you're giving in to temptation. Maybe you're barely holding on. And as we consider this this passage about warfare, we must consider our commander. We must consider Christ. Ephesians 1, the end of Ephesians 1, Paul starts this book by talking about Jesus, who is far above the principalities and the rulers. He is far above Satan and his demons. He is seated at the right hand of the Father. And the reason he is seated is because he is victorious, because he has conquered death. Our king, the the head of this army, has already overcome the outcome in this battle is certain victory. It's already been determined. Jesus was resurrected from the dead. He has defeated death. And we find ourselves in a battle with an outcome already determined, already victorious. And the conquering king, he gives us spiritual resources so that we can continue to fight. And if you are in this battle, it is because you are alive, because you have been made alive. And that's because Christ is alive because he is ruling from heaven. So take up this week at home, at work, at school. As you go about your your daily lives, take up these resources from the risen king. Truth, righteousness, the stabilization of the gospel of peace so that we can be courageous soldiers in the Lord's army and we fight with confidence with the power of the the resurrected Christ. We have access to that power, to that victory already in heaven. Would you pray with me as we close? Lord Jesus, we thank you for not leaving us stranded, not leaving us as orphans in this world. You give us uh, your spirit. You give us spiritual resources, Lord. You give us weapons to fight. And I pray that as we fight this battle, we would be faithful ambassadors. We would be salt and light in a dark place. I pray that you would raise up a generation in this church, a generation of of courageous soldiers, soldiers who love you, who fight courageously, uh, servants who don't rely on their own strength, uh, conquering Jesus in the way that you taught us, not through pride, not through human ingenuity, but through sacrifice, your sacrifice, Jesus, in our place. So we thank you for your death. We thank you that you are the exalted king. I pray that we would live in light of that truth today. Pray that we would be courageous warriors for your name and for your glory. Amen.